and uh, I suffered a burnout. And I'm before I knew it, I knew I had to change my lifestyle completely to to not go down that road again. And ever since that moment, I've um, I've been passionate about trying to help other people um, and try and break down the stigma and try and get people to. Um, you know, have the confidence and the courage to be able to speak up because when they do speak up and when they do break down the stigma, then that's often the first steps towards recovery. And it certainly was for me. And I changed my life um, literally from the moment I was diagnosed for the better. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to uh, The New Normal, our web series that is all about helping each of you find whatever your new normal is. Our guest today is the senior enlisted advisor to the Chiefs of Staff Committee of the British Armed Forces, Glenn Houghton. Uh, and he is the SEAC, just like uh, our SEAC, uh, Chief CZ Colon Lopez, uh, same level of responsibilities, the most senior enlisted or the most senior uh, enlisted uh, person in the British Armed Forces. And what I really like about uh, Glenn is that he's become a champion uh, for mental health and well-being for all of the service members uh, across the forces. So, uh, Glenn, my friend, welcome to the show. My pleasure, Kay. Thanks for having me. Really looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, man. I, I appreciate it. So you, you've been to SEAC since about 2018. What's been the most challenging? What, what's, what have you discovered about this role and about the, the service members in, uh, in the U.K.? Yeah, I think that the biggest challenge for me was because I'm the first SEAC. We've not had one before. I think CZ is now number four for you guys. Right. Um, so for me to set up the, the SEAC role um, to, um, inaugural position was the, was the biggest challenge for me. And uh, I've been in it now, like you say, since 2018, um, the end of. And um, yeah, it's just like, uh, you know, all of these enlisted roles that we're in, many of them like yours, has been established for some time. But when you've got to set something up at that level, at the senior levels of defence, it's, it's pretty tricky because... You always get naysayers, you always get blockers, you'll get non-believers and you'll get people that haven't necessarily got the faith um, in these types of role. Um, and I think some people in the military, certainly in the UK, are reluctant to change. So that was my, my first kind of job to do in, the, in this position was to make it irreversible. Um, and I think that's why the, the mental health and well-being champion role, which I've combined, sort of linked into it, has really helped with that. And I think... Um, once people see you tell your own story and really immerse yourself into that kind of business, then they they, they buy into it. So, sort of 18 months into it now, I think it's pretty well established. And the service personnel across all of the services have really bought into it, which is which is which is great. Yeah, wow, man, it's good being the first because you were, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, you were the first uh, sergeant major of the army as well, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm not the guinea pig. Yeah, <laughs> so, Dude, yeah you're a trailblazer, man. So we always we always had a senior sergeant major in the in the British Army, but it was always uh, our West Point equivalent at Sandhurst, right. and that was the senior sergeant major role. But we just never had the position. Our Air Force and our Navy and our Marines they had one. It was just the Army didn't. And like I say, they were change. So I took that job, and that was even more of a challenge than setting up the SEAC role. Um, the SEAC role because I'd done the Army job, I was pretty much you know. I was clued up on what I needed to do, but the army one was a real challenge. And although our army is much smaller than yours, um, you know, set in their ways, it was quite hard work to, to really establish it and get people yeah. to buy into it. Hey, so tell me, well, what was your, uh, prior, prior to COVID-19, uh, what was your battle rhythm like in terms of, uh, were you spending a lot of time on the road visiting uh, the soldiers, sailors, uh, airmen and, and Marines? Um, and then what is it like now? What's, what is your new norm? <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I think my SEAC role is different to, to yours in the US. Uh, and the reason for that is because you've got your combatant commands um, and your combatant command C cells tie into CZ um, differently to us so because we don't have combatant commands like that. We've got our services. I tie mm -hmm. in very heavily with our service sergeant majors and warrant officers. Um, so there's a, there's a slightly different dynamic. And what that means is I have much less to do operationally um, although there are some operational visits, particularly when I visit with my boss, the chief of the defence staff, much of that is down to the service sergeant majors and warrant officers of each of, each of those. So more of my stuff is, as you'd expect, to do with policy. Um, I do a lot more in the Ministry of Defence. Uh, 
um, to, um, than I would do getting out and about. But there is still, I try and visit the joint locations as much as I can. And when I do go and visit, I visit with the relevant service sergeant major or CSEL um, or senior enlisted guy um, to complement each other on the visit. And it's been really, really useful because I had a lot to learn. The Navy and the Air Force, you know, I've grown up in the Army for 32 years. I had no idea about the Navy and the Air Force, really, because, you know, our tri-service and jointness, we're very good in operations, but when we're not on ops, we do very little of it. So I had a lot to learn. Okay, good. And so what about now? What's what's changed? How, how has uh, COVID-19 changed, you know, how, how you yeah. operate as a SEAC? I've, I've found myself becoming a virtual SEAC, and I've got to be honest. Yeah. I mean, uh, Zoom... Teams, blue jeans, house party, you know, I'm, I'm rubbish at technology. So I've been thrown at the deep end over this COVID period. But it's been, I've, I've, I've actually loved it. And I've managed to reach people or a wider audience virtually and through COVID than I have even in my job normally working out the Ministry of Defence. So I found it really beneficial. Don't get me wrong. It took me a, a long period of time to settle into it. Like it probably did you and everybody else that's listening. Mm-hmm. Um, but once I got into my rhythm and my routine, then I, I found it really beneficial. And it wouldn't surprise me if my you know working techniques don't change in the future. I do a lot more of this kind of stuff. Yeah, no, I I, I agree, man. I, I think I'm the same way. Uh, even though I'm I'm transitioning here in a, in a couple of months, uh, I'll, I'll recommend to whomever replaces me to really take a look at uh, utilizing these virtual platforms to yeah. to connect with. Uh, in in our case, airmen across the the force. Um, so it's Mental Health Awareness Week uh, in in the UK, and I know, man, this is something that's very near and dear to your heart, uh, just just like me. Um, you know, what's the, what's the message that, uh, you want? And I know, I, I think you, I, I watched the video you put up, uh, either today or, or yesterday, but, um, what's the message you would want your listeners, uh, to know about, uh, mental health awareness and resilience, suicide prevention, um, this week, where, where should they be focused? Yes. Yeah, something that's, as you say, is very close to my heart because I have my own mental health issues in the past and they weren't to do with, uh, you know, operationally focused or trauma or, or anything like that. They were to do with the, the pressures and pace of life. You know, we work, we work very hard, particularly in these positions that can be lonely. And, uh, I suffered a burnout and I'm, you know, I never thought I would when people look at me and you and the likes of us, they never expect people like us to suffer from it. And mm-hmm. when I did, it came in like a sidewinder, you know, it completely took my legs from under me. Um, caught me out and um, before I knew it I knew I had to change my lifestyle completely to to not go down that road again and ever since that moment I've um, I've been passionate about trying to help other people um, and try and break down the stigma Mm -hmm. and try and get people to um, you know have the confidence and the courage to be able to speak up because when they do speak up and when they do break down the stigma then that's often the first steps towards recovery and it certainly was for me and I changed my life um, literally from the moment I was diagnosed for the better. So, you know, I do a lot of this stuff now, the whole championing bit, and I do a lot of social media on Twitter and Instagram and the like um, to encourage people to break it down. And when they see people like us doing that messaging, it goes a long way. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, for me, um, I try and say to everybody that mental health doesn't discriminate. Um, there's so many different types of forms of mental health illness that we're, we're aware of, but it doesn't discriminate and it can literally come and, and take you out of nowhere. And no matter how strong and big and tough and hard we think we are, um, it, it doesn't matter. Um, when, when, you know, when that time happens, it comes and you, you're unaware of it. So for me, it's just, um, it's all about prevention and deterrence now. And that's what I try and encourage people to do. And I, you know, I, I I, I give people, I've got like a COVID rule of 10 that we can go through if you want to later, but I give people a rule of 10 that I try and live by um, because it helps me to manage my mental health because that's what it's, you know, it's just part of my battle rhythm now. It's just daily routine to manage my mental health. I've spent 30 years like you have, you know, running the hills and my knees and my hips aren't, aren't in good shape nowadays because that's all we used to do was physical exercise. I'd never trained my mind. I'd never trained my spirit or my soul, if you like. And now I do this trilogy of all three things. And, uh, it, you know, it, it looks after me and I try and encourage other people to do the same. Yeah. So a couple of things in there, man, I want to, you know, pull a, pull a string on. Uh, one, uh, you talked a little bit in the beginning about uh, stigma. So yeah. how, how what what do you think has been the turning point or or has there been a turning point in reducing the stigma uh, in your armed forces? Because I, I saw you on an interview where you said, hey, back back in the day, this is no different than, than, than our armed forces. Back in the day, man, it was taboo to talk about 
yeah. um, mental health or that you were having challenges. Ha- has it has the stigma been been reduced? And if so, what what do you believe was the turning point? Like what changed that helped people start raising their hand? And being I think the stigma. I think the stigma is slowly reducing, but it takes time. You know, it's a culture change, and we all know that. Culture takes a long time. Climate, you can change pretty quick, but culture takes takes an age sometimes. And if everyone within that culture isn't prepared to change, then it won't. So I think it's very slowly getting there. I think uh, 15 years of campaigning in Iraq and Afghanistan, I think has gone a long way towards it. And that's when we certainly in our forces brought in trauma risk management, the trim system. Um, and I think that uh, highlighted the fact that people were starting to suffer from mental health issues, not solely PTSD, but all the other stuff as well. So I think that's gone a long way towards it. And I've got to say, over the last sort of three years, two to three years, each of our services as well have now developed their own uh, methods of training, mental resilience training, where we're now focusing um, on each of our service personnel from the very first day they join all the way through their career. So we set them up for their veteran um, life thereafter. And that's, you know, that's been a game changer for us. Um, combined with the mental health champion thing and me trying to signpost and raise awareness, I think it's gone a long way too. So I think it's been a combination of everything has really brought it to the to the fore. And now that people are benefiting from it and the, the amazing medical services that we've got, it's, it's gone a, a long way. And I find it, I'm, I'm amazed, as you probably are, that we did have it strictly taboo for so long and that we just we just turned a blind eye to it for so many years. Um, and much of that is down to our macho, uh, predominantly male, um, alpha male environment that you and I grew up in. Yeah, no, it's, uh, we, uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly, man. We, we've reduced the stigma some. We still have a, a ways to go. I think one of the things that helped us was our Special Operations Command, uh, a program they, they uh, have called POTA, Preservation of the Force and Family, where yeah. um, they, they really taught us how to embed uh, the mental health professionals and helping agencies within the yeah. unit. And that was that was a, a big part of it. Um, how how did special, you? Yeah. Our special forces are the same as well. And when you when you've got guys like that, role models, and people that people look up to and know what they've been doing, then you know they resonate with it. I and mean, if they if they need help, and if they've got these um, programs in place, then everybody else can as well. Yeah. Um, what 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 gives you uh, or what gave you initially the courage to say you know as a very very senior. Uh, official in the in the military to say, hey, you know what, I, I struggled as well. And then, how did you overcome uh, the struggles that you had? Yeah, I think I was I was relatively lucky because because um, I suffered a burnout and I, I didn't actually know. So I I was wired. I was in my job. I was extremely busy. I was traveling a lot. I was drinking too much. I wasn't looking after myself. I wasn't listening to other people's advice. So when I went to the doctors and got diagnosed. I didn't actually realize, but when I then broke down in front of the doctor, I went for a knee injury, but when he drew it out of me with a series of questions and I essentially broke down, that's when it it just, it was literally like that in my head. Oh my God. It was a, almost like a, an epiphany, a eureka moment of, I now realize that I should have listened to people before. And I now realize that I'm, I'm in a bit of trouble, but mine, because we nipped it in the bud relatively early. Mm. Um, and I had a bit major and it probably took me about, you know, best part of seven, eight months to a year um, to, to get back on track properly. I still didn't have the confidence at that point to tell my boss because uh, I was the army sergeant major, the sergeant major of the army then. I didn't have the confidence. Um, but then once I moved out of that job and into this one, I knew it was time to do something about it. And I knew that if, you know, because a few other people uh, that look like you and I have also come out about their own mental health issues, um, mm. I, it just struck a chord with me. And I thought, I can do this as well. And if, if people see me talk about it in the position that I'm in, then it's only going to help them. Um, and that's literally why I did it. And once I got the, the feedback and, uh, you know, saw how much it was helping people, I just knew it was the way to go. And I've continued it ever since. And I encourage anybody, anybody that's got a story to tell um, to do the same. Yeah. Now, and I know you encourage uh, physical fitness, uh, mindfulness, meditation. Uh, yeah. Tell me a little bit about your your daily routine when it comes to, you know, those those things that you think are important. Yeah. So uh, this goes back to the trilogy thing I was talking about. So I used to do the fitness all the time. So if you just imagine a triangle with mind, body, spirit on it, um, okay. those three points are what I do every day. So I train all three parts. 
and that is literally through exercise and mindfulness and meditation and my exercise routine you know we're getting old now so i don't i don't run anymore um, but i do a lot of low impact stuff i do a lot of kettlebells i do a lot of yoga um i do a lot of you know burpees and hit stuff and um, calisthenics and i really enjoy that uh, I still do my PT in the morning. That's when I like doing it the most. Um, but I also, you know, some people get wrapped around the axles in terms of meditation and mindfulness and they don't really understand it or they think it's for hippies. Um, and they don't think it's something that's going to, you know, appeal to them. Um, and some people think, oh, I can't do meditation. I've tried it and my mind's too busy. Uh, I'm just going to leave that. But that's the whole point. That's why meditation and mindfulness are good for you. Now, some people can sit down and just do meditation. You can follow guided stuff on YouTube and someone can speak to you and get you to follow a routine. But I tend to do mine just through the day as part of my battle rhythm. You know, I take breaks in the day. I get out in nature. Um, I'll listen to birds singing. I listen to water going under the bridge. I listen to things in the distance and I just focus on it. And for me, it's all about being in the present moment. It's not worrying about the past. It's not worrying about what's coming up in the future. It's just grounding myself three, four, five times a day and just focusing on my breathing and being happy to be alive. And that's what I do now. I never did that before. I was so busy and under pressure and working too hard and I just didn't concentrate on it. So now I do I do mindfulness and meditation, a bit of a combination for me. Sometimes I'll do guided and sit down and do it. Sometimes I'll just do it as I'm walking around in my garden or when I'm going out for some fitness. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just, I can't recommend it enough to everybody. Man, I, I agree. I started uh, meditating probably two or three years ago because I went through a, a, a situation very similar to to yours the first year in, in this job. I was yeah. wanted to do a good job and I was just running so hard and I found myself, uh, I, didn't, I didn't get diagnosed, but I found myself physically, mentally, spiritually just drained. And I, I had a family, um, I lost my older sister right around the same time. And uh, sure. that was when I decided to be more deliberate about my uh, mental well-being, my physical yeah. well-being, what I was putting in my body and changed my diet and all that. That good stuff. But uh, yeah, I discovered uh, meditation. And, and I think you're right. Uh, because sometimes I, I, in the beginning, you know, the thought of, man, I got to do this every day. Even, on, even though it was only like five minutes, right? I'm like, man, I got to remember to do this every day. And then uh, I, lo I love your idea about just uh, allow it to happen naturally when you're out and about or take take breaks and, and, and be because it's just all about being present. So yeah, and it's, and it's not necessarily about doing meditation. It can just be, you know, meditation can be you doing something that you love, painting a picture, playing a musical instrument. It's just something that takes your mind off the worries and the problems that go around in your brain all day long. And if you concentrate on something else that you love, that's meditation for me. Yeah, no, that's good, man. Uh, tell me about your, is it the rule of 10? Uh, yeah. I think I saw a couple of different rules of 10 you had. Uh, one was yeah. kind of specific to COVID-19, and then uh, one was uh, maybe a little bit of your mantra. Uh, let, let's begin with the COVID-19. Uh, yeah, okay. So the COVID-19 one, I, 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 like, I love living by rules of 10. I'm a simple bloke. I like writing down a list of 10 and trying to stick to it. Yeah. And I did have the one you mentioned earlier, which was the original mantra, much of which is in the COVID one. Uh -huh. uh, but for me, I'll, I'll rattle through it. And if, you know, if listeners have got a notebook and pen, they can write them down. But number one in, the, in this mantra for COVID was um, to establish a routine. And I think when you're in lockdown, for me in lockdown, uh, the first in the UK, certainly in the first 10 days, in the jobs that we're in, I felt like I had no purpose. I felt like I couldn't do my job. How can I do my job like this? And it took me a while to you know, get a grip of myself and set up my daily routine. And for me now, I live a week as a week, week should be lived. I work from Monday to Friday. I get up in the morning. I PT. I shave. I shower. Um, you know, I'd recommend to anybody to do exactly the same and then keep your weekends the same as they were. Because I think it's easy during COVID for people to just merge everything into one, to be living a, you know, a seven day weekend and just yeah. sitting around in lounging pants, <laughs> eating, eating chocolate peanuts, you know. So a routine for me is really important. Number two um, is to avoid the news. It's easy for us to sit there and watch the depressing news, the statistics of deaths in the US or the UK and just get wrapped up in it. And I just make a point of getting an update in the morning, update in the evening, and then I turn it off. The third one is to limit social media. I mean, I do a fair amount of social media. Um, a lot of the youngsters do even more than I. And it's easy to sit there and just flick through that screen all day, um, taking in the information. If people go into the settings on their phone, you can see just how many hours you've been looking at your phone screen for. So I limit it, I upload, I download, I put it down, and I go and do something more beneficial. 
Number four is to stay away from the fridge or the refrigerator, the cupboards, the larder, the pantry, the chocolate peanut store, you know, your, the, your, your chips and your Coke and your monster and all that stuff. You can just, you can just keep, you know, you're laughing. You can just open it and you can just eat this stuff all day long. And yeah. before you know it, you've got another hundred pounds and then you're whinging, moaning that you've put on all this weight over this period of time. So I just keep it shut <laughs> apart from breakfast, lunch and dinner. And I try and have protein shakes or fruit in between. Um, the next one is avoid midweek booze, alcohol. Um, in the UK, you know, we've, we've, our seasons are, are pretty set. And when the sun's out, like it is at the moment, we, we like to drink alcohol in the UK. Um, so it would be easy for me to open some cider or some beer when the sun's out every day of the week. But I have to stop myself doing it because we know it's bad for your health and it piles on the pounds as well. Uh, the next one is to um, exercise every day. I mean, you and I do it. Um, military, for us guys, it's, it's easy because most of us do do that. But it's keeping that motivation. I do an hour every day uh, and I mix it up. Um, and for me, it's just essential part of, of this lockdown. And I've done more fitness, I've got to say, um, down period in the UK than I've ever done before. I'm in better shape now than I have been. So I'm, I'm really enjoying getting the fitness in. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next one um, after that is to meditate every day, which we've talked about. Um, I, honestly, I, I recommend it to anybody, even if it's five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or even if you just do it like we said, all the way through the day, um, it's going to help you out massively. Um, then the next one after that is to communicate, um, easy, um, to not communicate with those that you love. Um, I'm a fine one for this because my mum, if she could see this podcast now would be telling me off because I don't phone her enough. Um, but I think it's important to pick up the phone and speak to people that we love or perhaps vulnerable people or people that we know of that might be lonely living on their own. Um, just reach out to them, make them feel happy and it'll make you feel good. Uh, number nine is to do things that you love easy again to just let things fall by the wayside um be it the painting or the musical instrument or doing puzzles or whatever it is drawing i think it's really important that if you have let them fall by the wayside because our jobs are normally busy outside busy outside of covid then pick them back up again start doing the hobbies that while you've got the chance to do it and it might change your life and the last one for me i've had to change it slightly for the uk because the uk's uh, motto was stay at home and that's now changed for us to stay alert. And it was originally stay at home because that's the least that we can do um, in the military and abide by our government's guidelines. And it's probably the same for you in the US um, so that we can you know, um, support the frontline services, the blue light services and the military guys that are all helping out and anybody else that's helping as well. Because I think that's the least we can do to get through this COVID process. So that was it. That was my rule of 10. And I just yeah. try and keep that in the back of my mind and live by it every sort of day and it just keeps me ticking along and i put that on social media and some people have loved it and they, they really stick by it yeah i like it man I, I watched it on i watched you do it on uh social media i think you were sitting in your garden uh, you had some yeah kettlebells I, yeah I just done a bit of kettlebells yeah yeah and uh so i wrote it down man and i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna pass it along to uh my oh, school cool. that i deal with so we definitely appreciate that i want to go back to number nine though you say uh do something that you love you know what is it what is it that you love doing when you're not, you know, meditating, being mindful or working out. Like, how do you spend your, your free time having fun? I'm, I'm a fisherman. fisherman. So, uh, yeah, I love, I love fishing for carp. because it's, it's a big deal in the UK, uh, carp fishing. And so for me, that's a combination of, of meditation, mindfulness, getting out in nature, a little bit of solitude, because I think that's important in these jobs as well, because we do this, you know, talking um, dialogue stuff all the time. So for me to get two or three hours down by the lake, um, it's... it's great for my my mind body and my soul um and i absolutely love it and that's that's my the one thing that i love that i started again during covid because i let it fall by the wayside yeah no that's great man i'm a golfer i don't i don't do much fishing but uh same thing i like being out in nature man I, it helps me clear my mind yeah amazing uh, yeah yeah uh so what's next what how, how how long is your tour and then what's what's next so I think I'm going to be in this in this job until about either the end of 2021 or perhaps the start of 2022. And then, I don't know, I'm going to keep my options open. I could stay on because our, our system for um, senior enlisted um, is, is different to the US. So I could actually stay um, serving for a lot longer um, if I wanted to. But I might try and... Um, spread my wings. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm really keen still on the, the mental health side of life, and it might be something that I venture into. But I'm going to keep my powder dry until till next year, and then decide then. Yeah. Now, I also uh, read that man, you're you're pretty adamant about uh, improving your education. Now, you're already uh, have advanced degrees and 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 whatnot. Um, so, what's 
from an education standpoint, you know, what's what's next for you? What what have you been working on? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, for me, you know, a degree was a big deal for me. Uh, I I had no qualifications like most guys in the infantry, certainly in the UK anyway. I didn't have any qualifications most all the way through my career. And and then when I became the sergeant major of the army, that's when I thought, hey, I'm going to do this this masters, and I did it. And um, it was one of the worst experiences of my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't. That's a lie. I, did, I got a huge amount from it. I really enjoyed doing it, yeah. and I've I've often thought about doing more. And I know um, certainly in the US Air Force, I know you are big on this um, professional development for your airmen and women. And I, I commend you. you know, it's fantastic. It's great. I don't know if I'm gonna. I don't know if I'm gonna do any more sort of big education stuff. Uh, but I keep taking along and learning because I'm like a sponge, like most of us are. Yeah. Um, but, but what the reason? Part of the reason I did it was to encourage others. Um, again, to prove that it doesn't matter, you know, what your education was or wasn't when you grew up, you can still achieve it and you can get this kind of stuff done. And with the support that we get from the military in terms of funding the same as you guys, yeah. um, that, that's part of the reason I did it. Yeah. What, what keeps you up at night, man? What's what, uh, you know, what, well, do you what, know what? Nothing keeps me up anymore. And that's part of my other mantra um, with seven hours of sleep a night. So I'm big into sleep hygiene. Okay. And, uh, you know, I don't know about other people, whether or not they've done a sleep study or if they wear a Garmin or whatever else, but I started monitoring my sleep and um, I got to bed at 10 o'clock at night. I don't always go to sleep at 10, but I'm normally like a blow darted elephant. I'm gone as soon as my head hits the pillow. <laughs> and then I'm up at sort of 5, 5.30 and then I'll go and do my, my PT. But for me, I used to be an awful sleeper up until that point of burnout. I mean, really bad. Uh, waking at three, half three, four, half four, you know, writing things down, worrying. But now I've, through my mindfulness and meditation and just uh, monitoring my thoughts and trying to live in that present moment, I don't keep awake at night. Yeah, no, that's good, man. That's that's the one part of this whole mindfulness, mind, body, spirit thing that I still struggle with. I, I've struggled with it uh, since I was a young man. Uh, kind of the same thing Yeah, is... You know, I like staying up late. Uh, all the, th- you know, so some of the things that that you that you just said I shouldn't do: social media and news and and all that good stuff, and and worrying about the next day and writing down lists and ideas and thoughts and, and whatnot. So that's one thing I'll commit to being better about is uh, improving my my sleep. I got to continue working on that. So thanks. Well, it's important because everything everything's based around your sleep, and if you have bad sleep, then you know it's one of the most important things we can do is to sleep properly and get enough. And I average about. I average seven hours, seven, seven to seven and a half hours a night. Yeah. And I still get up early and do my PT. So, yeah, we're good. Well, uh, uh, that's all the questions I had for you, man. Anything else that uh, you wanted to mention or, or pass along to our audience and your audience? I think the only thing I'd like to say is, uh, um, you know, the the global network that you know you and I and CZ and all of the C cells have got. Um, I've I've been involved in that now for the best part of sort of seven years and it has been absolutely brilliant. I've met some friends for life. Um, I've learned a huge amount um, from the United States military um, and from the C-cell community, from all of the services. And, you know, I've only got a small brain and I've got to say that most of the things that I've put into place uh, in the UK, certainly in my last two jobs, I've stolen from other people. Um, and I, I think that's the beauty of these networks that we've got. And all I'd like to say is, um, you know, the stuff that I have done with the US military and I watch from afar and I keep in touch with you guys, you are seriously impressive people and a fantastic organization. And honestly, it's been a pleasure to work alongside all of you. And I hope to con- continue with that over the next couple of years while I'm in this job. And I'm really grateful for the for the camaraderie and the sort of brotherhood and sisterhood that we've got between our forces. Yeah, no, man. Thank you. You're a seriously impressive uh, person uh, yourselves, and uh, and 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 you're a role model not just for the the folks in the UK, but certainly for our uh, service members here in the United States, and and really for people abroad. Because I, I'm I'm uh, I'm hoping that uh, a lot more people are seeing uh, the messaging that you're doing uh, with respect to uh, mental health and mindfulness and, and wellness. So, uh, definitely appreciate it, man. Thanks for your friendship. Thanks, man. Uh, we got to do this more often, man, less, less, in a less formal, uh, fashion. So, uh, we'll, we'll be no, in touch. Thank you, uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate it, my friend. Thanks, Kay. And all the best with your transition if I don't see you before. Okay. Thanks, brother. Thanks, man. All right. How many years is that, mate?
It'll be just short of 32, man. So I think uh, we're probably about the same. Where are you at? You're at 31 years? I'm, I'm 32 now. 32. Okay. Yeah. So I would, I would hit 32 uh, next, next March. So I'm just a little bit over 31 at, the, at this point. Time flies. And all that moisturizing between the two of us, we've done well. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs>